What are the scariest crimes that's been happening in 2023? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, a squatting situation. If you're a landlord, you're gonna wanna watch out for squatters. Micaiah Barber, who's in the Army Reserves, faced a costly situation when Natasha Timmons, a squatter, took over her Houston home when she was called up for active duty. This caused Barber to lose roughly $50,000 total in lost rent and legal fees while dealing with Timmons. Barber had bought her three-bedroom, two-bathroom Houston home in the spring and had rented it to Timmons when she was deployed to active duty in Florida in the fall. Timmons initially signed a lease and paid $2,000 for the first two months of her tenancy. However, Timmons made exactly zero rent payments and she refused to vacate the property. Despite Barber's attempts to reach agreements with her, Timmons remained in the house and the situation deteriorated. And it's not like she had just fallen on hard times and didn't have the money or something. Timmons has been spotted driving a late model Mercedes SUV. During her court hearing, a judge ordered Timmons to repay the overdue rent with another hearing scheduled later that year. The crazy part is, because of bureaucratic red tape, Timmons still hasn't even received an eviction notice. As it turns out, Timmons also has a prior theft conviction before all this. Is that an indicator of whether or not someone would commit a crime in the future? Probably not, but doing a little checking may have helped. Number five, Instacart scammers. Here's a scary scam that can happen with buying groceries for delivery. Jill McCormick had been eagerly awaiting her digital Kroger order at her suburban Cincinnati home when she received a startling message. Her bank account had been charged almost $2,800. The friendly Instacart shopper assigned to pick up her groceries went by the name of Danielle. Danielle had told McCormick via text that the store had run out of her preferred energy drink flavor and asked if she could substitute with another. McCormick had approved the change via text. The next thing she knows, McCormick gets a notification about the $2,800 charge. So of course she freaks out, but was quickly reassured by Danielle that it was a mistake that was easily fixed. But when McCormick later asked for an update about the charge, there were no more replies. So she reached out to both Kroger and Instacart, eventually reaching both after about an hour of online chats and toll-free hotlines, which like, you know how that goes. The customer service line is always buried. Shout out in the comments if you agree. Unfortunately, the money had disappeared from McCormick's account and one expert suggested that this incident might be the work of an organized retail theft ring. A simple web search reveals a similar incident involving a Kroger order using Instacart that occurred in suburban Columbus, Ohio, when a thief claimed to have stolen from hundreds of victims. The Cincinnati-based supermarket giant Kroger offers home delivery through its growing in-house service, but also via outside delivery vendors such as Instacart. One former Kroger worker even claimed in TikTok posts that her old store was using Instacart shoppers that were a bunch of scammers. Neither company has explained how a scammer intercepted a Kroger order that began on Kroger's app. It appears either Kroger or Instacart unwittingly gave the order to a thief or the scammer exploited a security breach. McCormick's shopper canceled all the items of her original order and drained her bank account to purchase several items that she didn't order and never receive. At least Kroger said it's refunding the money and will also provide a gift card to McCormick for the inconvenience, so it's nice to see one of these places do the right thing. While Kroger provides home deliveries around the country using its delivery force sent from warehouses, it also also augment services using San Francisco-based delivery service Instacart, who hires outside contractors. McCormick said her order began on the Kroger app but was assigned to Instacart. McCormick realizes she made one careless mistake with her online order. She used her debit card, which is always a big no-no just in the event of fraud. She normally uses her credit card, but McCormick said that she had grown comfortable just using the Kroger app. It's worth saying twice to always remember to always use a credit card for any online orders. Just just in case of scammers. Or just go get your own groceries, like we used to in the old days. Number four, it's all Greek to me? Nah. Can we all remember to not get any mixed drinks in unfamiliar places when we're on vacation? Several bars in the popular Greek party town of Kavos on the island of Corfu were closed down after authorities suspected them of tax evasion and selling potentially smuggled or tampered alcohol. And by that, we mean used drinks. The Independent Public Revenue Authority of Greece, along with local police officers, conducted an operation on the bars of Kavos to check if they were registering all transactions and if the 
alcohol was clean and legal. They found that 26 catering businesses hadn't issued roughly 40,000 receipts, amounting to roughly $286,000. Furthermore, seven catering establishments were found to be serving drinks without lot number markings, suggesting potential smuggling or reuse of the alcohol. It was revealed that some of these bars had a practice of collecting unfinished drinks from customers and storing them in barrels to serve to other patrons as shots. Can it get any less sanitary? Wait, don't answer that in the comment section. Cavos is a popular party destination for tourists and had been informally considered a no-go zone for inspections for many years, according to Greek news agencies. The closure of these bars came in the wake of an investigation into the passing of a young tourist, Hannah Bjorn, in Cavos. Authorities are still trying to figure out the exact cause of her unfortunate passing. The answer lies in the toxicology tests that haven't been completed as of the release of this video. And back in our day, all the old drinks dumped into one vat was called dishwater. If you drank it, it's because you lost a bet. Shout out in the comments. What did you call it? Number three, granny theft. A 65-year-old grandmother in the UK who was only identified as Lou has confessed to shoplifting luxury items on behalf of wealthy clients. Just remember, criminals come in all ages, shapes, and sizes. Lou earned up to 500 pounds a day from her illegal activities. Her brazen thefts include stealing items such as steak, lobster, champagne, Egyptian cotton sheets, and even 14-pound dog treats. She claimed to have around 60 clients, many of whom reside in upscale areas of London. Lou said that her clients, whom she refers to as tight poshos, which is apparently British slang for cheap, posh people, turn to her when they want to save money. Even though Though her clients aren't exactly short on money, they still want to save where they can because of rising fees such as private schools or mortgages. She said that these clients, despite their affluence, often haggle over prices and are careful with their spending. Lou, a grandmother of five, said she began her shoplifting activities as a service to four or five clients, but quickly expanded to 60 as word of mouth spread. She typically targets high-end stores like Harvey Nichols and Harrods, but she also steals from retailers such as Marks and Spencer. She mentioned that her clients often request luxury items such as premium vodka and expensive champagne, with some clients instructing her to get as many bottles as she could. Lou attributed her decision to turn shoplifting because of her husband's passing and the financial troubles that arose as a result. Her illegal business only expanded rapidly from there. While Lou has been caught multiple times, she says she simply attributed her forgetfulness to non-payment. So is Lou actually remorseful? The short answer is no. She defended her choices, saying that it's her decision and those who judge her aren't forced to buy stolen items from her, which is probably the exact same logic dealers use. So you're not exactly in the best company, Lou. Number two, a toll to be paid. When we think we're invincible, that's exactly when we're most vulnerable. Accountant Diana Nikitenko, a mother of three from Australia who lives in Sydney's eastern suburbs, fell victim to a scam that cost her roughly $3,000. It all started when she received a simple text message from someone claiming to be from the road toll operator linked. This would be like getting a text message from someone claiming to be from Fast Track or SunPass. The rep said that Diana had a failed payment for a toll charge and needed to settle it. Having recently used linked, Diana believed the message was legitimate. She clicked on the provided link, which looked convincing. The next day, she discovered $3,000 had disappeared from her account in mysterious purchases from Sephora. Sounds like linked was trying to impress someone on a first date. Diana quickly contacted her bank to dispute the transactions. She admits that she's hyper aware of scams and that she's actively looking out for them, but she had let her guard down when the coincidence of her having used link very recently happened. Remember, don't click on links in unexpected messages and look for typos or grammatical errors. If you actually really want to follow up, look up the number for any supposed company that's contacting you directly on the internet and then go through the official contact info find yourself. Number one, trusting TSA. We've covered TSA officers before, but because of how brazen the theft that was captured on newly released video footage is, we had to cover them again. Surveillance footage released revealed two TSA 
TSA officers, Jose Gonzalez and Liberius Williams, allegedly stealing at least $600 in cash and other items from passengers' luggage at Miami International Airport. The two TSA workers were arrested after an investigation into theft claims at the checkpoint. Video footage from the checkpoint shows the alleged thieves stealing money from wallets and purses as passengers pass through the x-ray machine. The thefts occurred while passengers were focused on the screenings and not paying attention to their belongings. Gonzalez and Williams, along with their co-worker Elizabeth Fuster, were arrested on charges related to an organized scheme to defraud. Fuster's charges were dropped, while both Gonzalez and Williams have pleaded not guilty to third-degree felony grand theft charges. Gonzalez entered a deferred prosecution program, which could result in his charges being dropped upon completion, but he has to pay $700 to the identified victims, complete 25 hours of community service, and relinquish his airport credentials. Williams was not accepted to the program, so he has to stand trial. Gonzalez and Williams both admitted to a bunch of thefts, supposedly averaging almost $1,000 per day when they were working together. Here's a reminder to always, always have the cash in your pocket or in your hand when you're going through security at the airport. We hope we don't need to tell you to not put cash or any valuables in checked luggage. These types of thefts likely happen all the time. The officers just don't get caught. Who are a few of the unluckiest people? Let's get right to it with... Number 8. Innocent Woman Wanted Eva Lopez found her picture on a wanted poster despite the fact that she'd done nothing wrong. Lopez was stepping off a flight in Florida when her friend texted her about a wanted poster that had her picture on it. The poster said that she was wanted for theft and being a lady of the night. Lopez didn't take the poster seriously because she thought it was an elaborate joke. There was no way she could have been wanted for those crimes since she never committed them once, let alone enough times to land on a poster. However, Lopez decided to contact the number on the poster anyway and was put through to a New York detective. The detective said he knew the poster was incorrect before Lopez even called. He said that the poster had been made in error and was already removed from the police station and everywhere else it might have been pasted. He then simply wrote it off as a case of mistaken identity. The person who was actually wanted was associated with the theft of a Rolex after being hired as an escort online. The theft happened in Manhattan on August 3rd. But Lopez wasn't even in Manhattan on that day. She was in Queens. So checkmate, detective. Police said they recognized their error when they discovered that the actual wanted person had a tattoo sleeve and Lopez didn't, which is kind of hard to miss if you're paying attention. They also said the thieving escort might have been using Lopez's photo on her social media to obscure her true identities. But the deed was done. The image of the poster was already circulating online and people were already using it to malign Lopez's image. This was particularly harmful since Lopez works as an influencer and her image is an important part of her livelihood. So, she decided to sue the police department for $30 million in damages. Number 7. Barely Missing Millions Aiden Murray got the shock of his life when he realized that he was just one number away from winning the lottery. The cash prize for the lottery Aiden missed out on what was slightly over 156 million pounds. But instead of winning the grand prize, he had to go home with a sorry prize of 666 pounds. Before the lottery numbers were announced, Aiden bought two tickets online and two from a shop. When the numbers were announced, he quickly checked his mobile app and found out that those tickets Tickets were not winners, just like us. When he checked his physical ticket, he discovered that he'd been just one digit away from being a millionaire. We're usually about six. His ticket had the numbers 5, 9, 25, 29, with special numbers 6 and 7. The winning numbers, on the other hand, were 5, 9, 25, 30, and the same special numbers. If his numbers had totally tallied, he would have become a millionaire overnight. But he was just not in luck. Aiden was so shocked by this turn of events that he made a tweet about it and got over 30,000 likes. People just couldn't believe that one man would be that unlucky. So what did Aiden do with his 666 pounds? He summoned the Antichrist. Okay, just kidding, but we noticed the number two. Instead, Aiden did what anyone would do in his circumstances. He bought Chinese takeout for his family and spent the rest of the money on saving for a home. Number six, half for you too. 
Richard Zelasco was the luckiest man in the world when he won $80 million in a lottery jackpot. But his luck didn't last for too long. Richard was married to Mary Beth, and they shared three children. At around the same time he won the lottery, he was dealing with a messy divorce. In fact, the couple had been separated for two years. When Richard got his winnings, the arbitrator of the divorce argued that since Richard's divorce wasn't final yet, the winnings were part of the divorce estate. The winnings were reduced to just $38 million after taxes and deductions. The arbitrator argued that half of the winnings should go to his wife, who had played no part in purchasing the ticket. The court agreed and ordered Richard to make the payment to his ex-wife. They finalized their divorce shortly afterward. It's hard to be mad about $19 million, but still, they were separated for two years. In the end, you have to wonder though, who was the a-hole? Number five, stolen dreams. Jose Rivera claims that a lottery ticket worth $2 billion was stolen from him after he bought it. According to Rivera, he bought the winning lottery ticket a day before the draw was done. And that same day, someone stole the ticket from him. Yeah, us too, Jose. Rivera says that the thief was some guy named Reggie. So what did Rivera do after discovering that the ticket was a winner? He claims that after his discovery, he approached Reggie and asked him to return his ticket. But in typical Reggie fashion, he said he would only give it back if the winnings were split 50-50 which doesn't make any sense if he actually had the ticket. So Rivera refused this arrangement and went to the police to get justice. Three months after the winning numbers were drawn, a winner was announced, and his name was Edwin Castro, not Reggie some guy. So Rivera saw this win as fraudulent and decided to file a lawsuit against the Lottery Commission and Castro and Reggie. In his lawsuit, he treats Reggie and Castro as two different people. He also doesn't give any explanation as to how they might have met or how Reggie might have given the ticket to Castro. It does sound like typical Reggie though, doesn't it? Like you hear Reggie did it and you're like, yep. The Lottery Commission, who probably deals with this sort of thing on a weekly basis, says that they did all they could do to authenticate the ticket and were satisfied that Castro was the winner. They also say that any criminal activity accusation would have to be investigated by the police and validated by the courts. So for now, Castro remains the winner of the $2 billion windfall. Our dear Jose Rivera is still litigating his way through the courts to see if if he would be declared the winner. It kind of sounds to us like Reggie was having a little fun and Rivera is a bit gullible. But if Jose gets anything, with how flimsy a story is, we're gonna make a few phone calls. Do you know how many winning lotto tickets Reggie stole from us? Like, probably a million. Number four, Undercover Grandma. A 90-year-old woman lost over $30 million to a phone scam after believing an elaborate lie. The woman lives in one of the wealthiest regions of Hong Kong and fell victim to a phone scam that targets the wealthy elderly in the area. The scam started when the grandmother was called by someone claiming to be from the Chinese government. The officials claimed that her identity had been used to commit dreadful crimes on the Chinese mainland. They explained that she needed to transfer all her money from her current bank accounts to ones held by them for safekeeping. And we get it, but that sounds shady as hell, doesn't it? The grandmother was convinced and listened to their advice. Over the next five months, she transferred over $30 million to the scammers. The person who picked up the transfers was a 19-year-old kid who always showed up at the woman's residence armed with a direct line to the frauds. This allowed him to facilitate the transfers and continue taking money from the woman. But this scam, like most others, couldn't last forever. The grandmother's maid noticed something suspicious was happening, so she called the woman's children. They were the ones who finally put an end to the scam and involved the police. The police were then able to find and arrest the kid. While the last bit might have been unlucky to have lost that much money to scammers, at least the thieves were actually caught. What an awesome maid though, right? Usually they're the ones stealing from the rich old ladies, aren't they? Number three, the unluckiest couple. Martin and Kay Tot had the misfortune of misplacing their lottery ticket after their numbers were announced as the winning digits way back in 2001. They were able to report their loss after Camelot, the operator of the UK lottery, announced that the winner was yet to claim their prize as the deadline for claiming it drew closer. As you would expect, Camelot receives loads of false claims for missing lottery tickets and expected this one to be the same. However, when Martin called and made his claim, they thought he was most likely telling the truth. Martin knew the time and place the ticket was bought, things he could never Never have known if he hadn't bought the ticket. The evidence was circumstantial, but also very convincing. Ordinarily, this would mean that the Tots would get their prize and be on their merry way. In fact, Martin and Kay had already started imagining how they would spend their money. The lottery company had told them to keep 
quiet about the ticket and that they would be contacted after a decision was reached about what to do with them. They waited for four weeks and when Camelot got back to them, they had a story to tell. The Tots couldn't be awarded their three million pounds. The lottery had a policy that voided tickets that weren't reported as lost within 30 days. The Tots had only told the company about their lost ticket months after it had gotten lost. The 30-day appeal window had closed. No ticket, no 30 million pound taco. When the Tots were told about their sorry predicament, they could hardly believe it. When the news was leaked to the press, they were labeled Britain's unluckiest couple. They got so popular that Richard Branson, the billionaire owner of Virgin Atlantic, offered them a free haul holiday on his private island. He also publicly urged Camelot to pay out the prize to the Tots, but the company refused. Then Prime Minister Tony Blair also had his say and urged the company to give the couple the cash prize. But again, Camelot refused. It couldn't go against its own policy, it said, which is dumb since they made the policy. Yet the Tots fought on. They fought for five years to get the prize money, but judgment after judgment said the same thing. They wouldn't get a dime. Ten years later, Martin, displaying some impressive mental gymnastics, told the world that he was sort of glad that he had never gotten the money. He claimed that there was no guarantee that it would have made him happy and that it might have made him even unhappier. Yeah, we don't think he believed it either, but what can you say at that point? The strain that the entire debacle put on their relationship made Martin and Kay break up. So not only did they lose a massive sum of money, but they also lost their marriage. Perhaps they really are Britain's unluckiest couple. We were going to say Romeo and Juliet, but they were in Italy, right? Number two, the wrong lottery. Rossi Carmina was disappointed after he bought the correct lottery numbers, but entered them into the wrong draw. Rossi's scorecard showed that his numbers matched the winning ones, but there was only one problem. He'd entered the numbers for another lottery. Rossi had bought the ticket after someone told him that he was lucky. He perhaps believed that his luck would hold and let him win, and he was right. Well, he wasn't entirely right. His luck had given him the correct numbers. The only issue is that he had played them for the wrong lottery. When Rossi first heard the winning numbers, he believed that he had won and was already celebrating. He was even already contemplating buying a Ferrari, but none of that was to happen. He entered the numbers for the January 7th, 2022 Euro Millions instead of the correct January 4th, 2022 draw. When he called up the lottery, he was given the devastating news that he hadn't won anything. His winning numbers had been played for another lottery. Do we really need to say that this left him devastated? Number one, unfunded accounts. Rachel Kennedy missed out on a 182 million pound lottery prize after playing the winning numbers without funding her lottery account. Rachel had been playing the same lottery numbers for about five weeks, and they had never won anything, just like everyone else's. Importantly, all the time she had played those same numbers, the ticket had gone through since her lottery account was funded. However, on one sorry day, she forgot to fund her account. This meant she couldn't buy the ticket she usually played. Guess what day it was? It was the same same day that the numbers became the winning lottery number for a 182 million pound prize. When Rachel first saw the notification on her lottery app, it showed that her numbers were the winning numbers and she was over the moon. She immediately told her mother and boyfriend, Liam McCrowan, about the happy news. Liam was an economics major in college, so he had already started spending the money in his head, thinking his girlfriend was now a millionaire. Unfortunately, that wasn't meant to be. Rachel called up the lottery company and they told her that yes, her numbers were the winning numbers, but she hadn't actually bought a ticket. That meant she had won nothing. In fact, the ticket had been recycled five times and then sold to someone in Switzerland who won the prize. Liam was so shocked by this news that he shared it with Twitter. He posted a screenshot of his girlfriend's lottery app and the notification saying she had the correct numbers. The tweet immediately blew up and got over 30,000 likes. People couldn't believe it. But it just goes to show how unlucky people can get. So what about the so-called lucky numbers? that Rachel kept playing. Is she still playing them? The answer is no. She's since changed the numbers as she claims that they are now unlucky numbers. We knew a guy who'd been playing the same lottery numbers for three years. They were his anniversary. He's romantic like that. Imagine his wife's face when their anniversary numbers came up and their ticket had different numbers on it. He's still on our friend's couch. What are some of the craziest financial losses people have had? Let's get right into it and start with... Number five, real life grand theft. Robert Alexander used to live a lavish style and would spend thousands at gambling tables in one night. He was a video game marketing mogul who'd once worked for the parent company of GTA, Take-Two Interactive. 
However, Alexander's fairy tale life fell apart when he was busted for securities fraud. Once upon a time, Alexander was a very wealthy man. He owned a video game distribution company and sold the company to Take Two for $30 million. Under normal circumstances, that's enough money for most people to live a comfortable life. But Alexander wasn't a man made for comfort. He was made for high stakes and risks, and he explored that part of his life through gambling. Alexander used most of the money he got from the payout to fuel a high-stakes gambling addiction. He bought himself a Maybach as well because there's no better car to drive to a high-stakes gambling game. But Alexander didn't just use his own money to gamble. He was also fond of borrowing money to gamble as well. You might think that borrowing money to gamble isn't a good idea, but Alexander disagreed. So he borrowed $200,000 from one friend, $700,000 from another, and never repaid a single dollar. What do you do when you lose almost all of your money in a decade-long high-stakes gambling stretch? Obviously, you create a company, fundraise, and spend that money on yourself rather than your company. And that's precisely what Alexander did. After losing all of his money gambling, he started a new company called Kazang. According to a former employee, there was never a coherent vision for how Kazang would make money. But Alexander couldn't be bothered with details like profit making. He also told investors that he'd invested a lot of his own money into the company and that he'd helped to create Grand Theft Auto, so he had a proven track record. He also claimed to have donated about $50 million to a Los Angeles hospital. Of course, he didn't do any of that. Instead, Alexander embezzled the money investors had raised, he spent it on himself, and used it to fund his lavish lifestyle. Alexander went to amusement parks, bought a vehicle for his daughter, and gambled the rest of the money away. But Robert's time living the good life was running out. Robert Alexander was arrested at a hotel on Long Island and was promptly charged with securities fraud and wire fraud. Once Alexander was safely in the hands of the police, he began to snitch relentlessly. His first target was Sherry Pryor Witter, an early investor in Kazang. He claimed that Witter had known that her stake in Kazang was worth nothing and yet sold the papers to another person. He argued that that was insider trading and that Witter should be punished. But Alexander wasn't really concerned with dispensing justice. He had a vendetta against Witter since she'd ratted him out to the police and made sure his entire scheme unraveled. She was the only reason the police were able to track down Alexander and he knew it. Once he was caught, Alexander quickly threw Witter under the bus in an attempt to save himself. He hoped that by alerting the SEC to Witter's fraudulent behavior, the court may pass a more moderate sentence in his case. But that's not the only trick Alexander had up his sleeves. So far, he's managed to avoid being sentenced to jail, despite having already pled guilty. Since making his plea, he's managed to postpone his sentencing hearing three times. The first two times, he cited the coronavirus pandemic. The third time, he argued that he was going blind and needed surgery to fix his eyes. Alexander hasn't been lying low since the swindle either. He's now launched a new business called Paragos. The company is a marketing firm and is currently taking on contracts. Hopefully, Alexander doesn't set up shop next to a casino. Number four, bearish intentions. Jimmy Kane was the CEO of Bear Stearns and was worth over a billion dollars at one point. However, in just over a year, Kane lost almost all of it. How does someone lose a billion dollars in less than a year? Well, the story starts with Jimmy running Bear Stearns. The company doesn't exist today, but when it did, it was one of the biggest global investment firms in the world. Kane, on the other hand, was a young boy who'd come from a humble background to lead the company. He had attended Purdue University, but dropped out halfway through to join the army. Kane left the army soon after to become a photocopier salesman. He also spent some time selling scrap metal. From there, Kane would rise to become the CEO of Bear Stearns after a chance meeting with Bear Stearns' then CEO. When Kane was eventually promoted to CEO, he indulged heavily 
He picked up an infamous habit for creative medication and was known for his chronic use of the devil's lettuce. In the end, Kane would be more known for his role in the 2008 stock market crash. Jimmy Kane's journey to being the CEO of Bear Stearns started with a game of bridge, a card game loved by everyone's grandma. In the late 60s, Kane quit his job as a photocopier salesman and decided to move to New York. Some people moved to New York to become hotshot lawyers or bankers. Kane moved to New York to achieve his dream of being a professional bridge player, which was a thing? When Kane got into the bridge circuit and started working his way up through the rankings, at some of these games he would meet a man named Alan Greenberg, better known as Ace Greenberg. Greenberg was the CEO of Bear Stearns at the time, and he loved playing bridge as well. After meeting Kane at games a few times, Greenberg was impressed by Kane's wits and decided to hire him as a stockbroker at Bear Stearns. And that's how Kane's adventure at one of the biggest firms in the world began. Over the next 10 years or so, Kane proved that a college degree or an education in finance wasn't necessary to be a talented stockbroker. He quickly became a partner at the company, and a while later, he was named president. When Greenberg was about to retire, he decided to hand over the reins to his protege, Jimmy Kane. Under Greenberg, Bear Stearns was known as a conservative company that avoided too much risk. Under Kane, it was the opposite. Kane increased the company's leverage ratio from barely any to 35 to 1. That means for every dollar that Bear Stearns owned, it had borrowed $35. The company also dove into new markets and launched aggressive hedge funds. Through all of this, Kane developed a love for the giggle plant and an unintentionally worked hard to earn his reputation for it. Kane was always publicly denied his love for oregano, but knowledge of his relationship was the worst kept secret on Wall Street. But that didn't stop Kane from reaching dizzying heights of personal success. His investment strategy was risky, but it worked well for a short while. He was able to amass a 5% stake in Bear Stearns, and the growth of the company soon meant that stake was worth a billion dollars. Kane became the first CEO on Wall Street to become a billionaire through equity. Soon, though, things were going to take a wild turn. Unfortunately for Kane, the going was only good for a short while. In June of 2007, two of Bear Stearns' highly leveraged hedge funds collapsed, and this revealed the chinks in the company's armor. As the funds collapsed, Kane was unreachable as he had gone for a 10-day-long bridge tournament. Yes, Kane still wanted to play bridge, despite being one of the most powerful CEOs in the country. The losses from these hedge funds revealed that Bear Stearns was a house of sticks and things started to snap little by little. The impending mortgage crisis worsened things as Kane had overexposed Bear Stearns to mortgage-related investments. Within 12 months, Bear Stearns' shares plummeted to $30 from an all-time high of $172. It became obvious that the company couldn't continue as an entity and needed to either file for bankruptcy or find a buyer. JP Morgan came to Bear Stearns' rescue and bought it for about $10 per share. This was an almost 99% reduction from the company's all-time high. In the end, Jimmy Kane's fortune, which had been worth a billion dollars, dwindled to less than 60 million. Kane had gone from being a billionaire to a millionaire in just 12 months. But it isn't all bad for Kane. He did somehow achieve his ultimate goal. At the time of his passing, he was ranked number 35 on the American Contract Bridge League's list of the best players of the decade, making him a winner and a loser. Number three, Grounded Jet. Kernbrell Tompkins is a former Patriots player who was accused of stealing over $250,000 from COVID relief funds through unauthorized access device fraud. Kernbrell Tompkins had withdrawn about $230,000 from Miami area ATMs as a part of the fraud. The money was part of funds supposed to be dispersed to individuals and businesses who were hard hit by the pandemic. Tompkins was able to steal this money through several stolen identities. This case is especially disturbing because Tompkins used to be a relatively wealthy man. As a player for the Patriots and part of the NFL, he earned about $1.4 million in earnings throughout his career. However, it seemed those earnings couldn't let Tompkins live the life he felt he deserved. So, he sought to supplement those earnings through fraud. Unfortunately for Tompkins, free lunches are never free. Our footballer turned fraudster was eventually caught by the police and was soon charged in court. Tompkins pled guilty to one count of unauthorized access to Vice fraud and one count of aggravated identity fraud. The court sentenced him to 25 months in jail with a year of supervised release. Number two, Iron Mike Trainwreck. 
Mike Tyson was one of the wealthiest boxers of all time, but he lost it and eventually filed for bankruptcy. In the 90s, Tyson was the toast of the town, the cat's pajamas, as well as the dog's tuxedo. He'd conquered the heavyweight division and was enjoying all the trappings that came with that title. He hosted lavish parties with some of the most glamorous people on earth and was always decked out in incredible jewelry. However, Tyson's day in the sun was never going to last forever. By the beginning of the 2000s, he was already running low on cash. And then came the divorce from his second wife, Monica Turner. Mike's income meant that he was going to pay a high divorce settlement, and he simply didn't have that much money in cash. So Mike started selling off his properties. The first to go was his beloved Connecticut mansion, complete with a nightclub and casino. Aside from having to pay for his divorce, he also had pretty huge debts. Tyson owed the British tax authorities about $4 million in taxes and owed the IRS about $13.4 million. He also owed his law firms, a music producer, his former trainer, and his financial manager. These debts totaled more than $2.5 million. Mike also owed over $50,000 in child support, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. When he filed for bankruptcy, it was revealed that Tyson was in debt by over $27 million. For years, Tyson spent money with reckless abandon. From 1995 to 97, he spent up to $9 million in legal legal fees while throwing a $410,000 birthday party. He also spent a small fortune of about $230,000 on pagers, an ancient communication device that just beeped a lot, and cell phones. And he owned two tigers, which is what you'd generally do when you have a lot of disposable income to spend. The thing is, those tigers gulped up to $150,000 each per year on feeding alone. Mike's spending habits had been notoriously out of control. In one of his more famous ex Tyson once bought his ex-wife, Robin Givens, a 1.7 million pound solid gold bathtub. He also had a proclivity for buying every car he could. Tyson had the rare Lamborghini LM002, which was worth over 100,000 pounds. He had an Escalade and a Hummer H2. The prize of his collection, however, was his incredible 400,000 pound Bentley Continental SC. By 2003, Tyson was completely bankrupt, but things only got worse for him. Two years, after his bankruptcy filing, Tyson pled guilty to charges of driving under the influence and cocaine possession. However, Tyson wasn't just resilient in the ring. He was resilient in life, too. Mike bounced back by launching his on-screen career when he played an altered version of himself in The Hangover. The Hangover was a box office smash that led to three sequels. And Tyson's life was finally looking up again. He appeared in the sequel two years later and finally cemented his reputation as a changed man. But some of Tyson's fans still want to be reminded of his crazy days. As Tyson stepped back into the limelight, he discovered that there was a market for people who wanted to take a picture of him biting off their ears. Tyson had famously bit off the ear of Evander Holyfield during a match, and his fans wanted a picture of him doing the same to them. Tyson's team decided to monetize that market and charge $200 per picture. Since then, Tyson has properly settled into his life as a star on the big screen. He's gotten parts in other films such as IP Man, and was even featured on a 2015 Madonna track that no one probably heard. Currently, Mike runs a popular podcast, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, with the co-owner of his cannabis farm, which earns him a half a million a year. Hopefully, now he can stay out of debt. Number one, Money Bolted. Usain Bolt is one of the most recognizable people in the world and currently holds the world record for the fastest time ever in 100 meters. Unfortunately for Bolt, he recently had a run-in with scammers and lost a lot of money. Stocks and Securities Limited, the company in charge of Bolt's retirement fund, had lost over $12 million of his money. When the company was probed for an explanation, it claimed that discrepancies in the Olympic medalist's account were due to a rogue former employee. But according to Jamaican authorities, it appears that Usain Bolt was a victim of a targeted scheme. The scheme had also targeted many elderly investors, but that wasn't the only bombshell. While Bolt was a recent victim, Jamaican authorities allege that the racket had gone on for at least 13 years. The discovery of the scam prompted action from the Jamaican government against Stock and Securities Limited. The government invited international partners and law enforcement organizations like the FBI to investigate the company and get to the root of the matter. Eventually, the Jamaican government sanctioned in the company and put it under state control. This is part of an ongoing effort to probe every transaction the company has been involved in and understand just how deep the rot goes. Hopefully it can be dealt with in record time. Here are the types of problems that rich people have to deal with. 
Let's get right into it with number five, Golfer Stalker. Professional golfer and influencer Paige Sporanic had a frightening encounter with a fan who accused her of scamming him out of thousands of dollars. Sporanic was at the American Century Championship when a male fan approached her. He asked for a picture with the golfer, but his demeanor quickly became threatening when he claimed she'd scammed him out of $10,000. Because it makes sense when celebrities, even low-level ones, ask their fans for some cash. Security spoke to the fan and warned him against approaching Sporanic, but he showed up on hole two during the championship. Championship. Sporanic's agent was forced to handle the situation himself. However, Sporanic was upset that security didn't remove him from the property. The fan's unhinged behavior stemmed from being the victim of a scam run by somebody using a fake profile to pose as Sporanic. She had nothing to do with the profile or the fake number attached to it, something the guy should have probably known or figured out on his own. Dealing with angry fans has become a common issue for Sporanic. Men were scammed by fake profiles of people pretending to be her who would do things like give them fake numbers and meet on Google Hangouts. Often, these men thought they were in relationships with Sporanic and believed she had ghosted them after they handed over large amounts of money. The profiles were anonymous, making it almost impossible for Sporanic to track all of the fraudsters down. Her anxiety over the situation became unbearable, and she eventually started wanting to not leave her house. Sporanic stopped sharing where she was and what she was doing on social media, which is always a good idea, but she was scared another angry fan would confront or even threaten her. Without the money and resources to have constant security, she didn't want to risk being in public where something could happen to her. Even though she withdrew from the limelight, she still dealt with stalker situations that worsened her anxiety. Many of her angry fans were relentless in their attempts to contact her. Sporanic warned the public that if an account didn't have a blue check mark next to her name, then it's fake. Number four, down the drain. A Florida car collector lost his brand new McLaren P1 when Hurricane Ian sucked the car from his garage. Ernie likely spent between one and a half million and two million dollars on his yellow and black supercar. Thankfully, it wasn't his only luxury car. If you were worried about his loss, he also owns a Rolls Royce Phantom worth $500,000. Ernie drove the McLaren all the time and filled his social media with photos of his big purchase for everyone to see. He posted pictures of himself driving driving downtown for brunch and on a Whole Foods run. It's surprising he could even afford those cars if he's shopping at Whole Foods. Ernie's Instagram looked like it belongs to some grandmother who overly dotes on her cats, but instead of cats, it's his McLaren. Florida residents learned that a massive hurricane was on its way and began to prepare for the brewing storm. Ernie hit the supermarket for supplies and, of course, shared pictures of the P1 filled with grocery bags on Instagram. He parked his two vehicles in the garage of his oceanfront Naples home. Since his house was so close to the ocean, the damage was unavoidable. Hurricane Ian, a Category 3 hurricane blasting winds between 111 and 129 miles per hour, made landfall and caused extreme damage to the Gulf Coast. Places like Fort Myers and Ernie's hometown of Naples saw the water levels rise six feet above the normal high tide. Ernie's garage flooded and the force of the water sucked his vehicles onto the street. When the high water levels washed away, Ernie found his brand new McLaren propped up by a toilet. Number three, 007 Super Yacht. A large James Bond themed super yacht sank near a Greek beach after a GPS malfunction led the boat to shore. Nicknamed 007, the yacht was sailing across Greece's Kelowna Bay near the popular island Kythnos when it began to tilt on the port side or the left side facing the bow and filled with water. The crew made several mayday calls to the Coast Guard who rescued them and their five passengers while the vessel quickly sank into the ocean. They left the boat on a Friday evening and it was almost entirely submerged by the next day. A Swiss businessman named Sammy Tamman, who sounds more like a Bond villain, owned the ill-fated super yacht. It was 160 feet long and could hold up to 10 passengers and five crew. Passengers could enjoy the luxurious finishes on the vessel's interior and exterior, which had its own helipad and the infamous 007 logo painted on its outside. It was the third largest super yacht built by Asian Yachts, who sold it in 2012. An investigation into the sinking revealed that the captain, Mr. Tamman himself, was experiencing a depth issue at the time of the incident, and his efforts to avoid sinking caused him to hit the bottom of the water. It tilted heavily and eventually flipped on its side. The super yacht was made of steel hull and had an aluminum structure. The sinking posed an environmental issue that the Coast Guard rushed to address. They worked overnight and put up an anti-pollution perimeter that helped prevent diesel leakage and damage to the surrounding area. Number two, unlikely partners. 
Hacker and scammer Ellis Pinsky was the ringleader of a $23.8 million crypto heist. Pinsky was only 15 years old at the time of the heist, and his friends and classmates said they didn't think there was anything unusual about the 10th grader. He enjoyed sports, had good grades, and loved computer games. Pinsky could be arrogant and once bragged to an acquaintance that he had millions of dollars and could buy the acquaintance and his entire family if he wanted. So he's a real sweetheart. Most of his peers thought he was making money through trading Bitcoin. The person at the center of Pinsky's elaborate crypto heist scheme was Michael Turpin, key figure in the crypto world and co-founder of crypto investment firm BitAngels. A group of hackers, led by Pinsky, hacked into Turpin's cryptocurrency account where they fleeced and laundered millions of dollars in cryptocurrency. Pinsky's getaway into crime was his love for video games, validating 90s parents everywhere. He was a member of private video game chat rooms where people often bragged about their hacks. He used a process known as SIM swapping, where hackers remotely transfer a victim's digital identity from the victim's phone to the SIM card in the hacker's phone. Once Pinsky had a victim's SIM card, he could steal their social media identity, including things like their Instagram tags. Pinsky quickly graduated from using SIM swapping to steal social media accounts cryptocurrency. The switch might sound dramatic, but he had already grown accustomed to stealing victims' private information when he stole their nicknames. The group of around 20 young hackers would identify their targets as people with large crypto accounts and find out the target's phone and carrier information. They forged identity information to get the carrier and swap the target's SIM card to one they controlled. Once the group had full access to their victims' phones, the hackers would enter the victims' wallets and transfer out their crypto holdings. One of Pinsky's accomplices was Nick Truglia, who was four years older than the teen and once attended Baruch College, majoring in finance and economics. Truglia was responsible for obtaining the target's cell phone and passcode numbers and conning the cell phone carrier into giving him a new SIM card. From there, he would hand the operation to Pinsky, who would execute the hack. It wasn't the only hacking scam that Truglia was a part of, and in 2019, he was arrested and charged for a different hack. Before his arrest, Truglia helped Pinsky access Turpin's BlackBerry. Within 48 hours of the hack, the $23.8 million Turpin had stashed in his digital wallet had been removed. Pinsky made sure that all the other hackers knew who was boss. Frankly, he was a control freak and a bully. One of Pinsky's friends had been part of Pinsky's illegal operation, and was supposed to be helping him launder money when the friend accidentally sent $700,000 to the wrong person. Because of the nature of crypto, they never got the money back. Pinsky demanded the friend pay him back the money, even if it meant he had to resort to selling illegal substances or his clothes. Pinsky ran a tight operation during heists, and every group member was given strict instructions they had to follow. He would brag that his job was stealing from Turpin and use the money he made from the scam to enjoy the finer things. Pinsky had an account with a private air service, and when traveling on the ground, he drove an Audi R8. He wore designer clothing and would score expensive Rangers hockey seats, which isn't all that impressive since no one watches hockey, much less the Rangers, but that's what he did. Pinsky's parents, who had already thoroughly failed in raising him, believed their son's sudden wealth came from making Bitcoin online. They had no clue about what was really happening or what kind of person he was. Although Pinsky had a designer wallet filled with $100 bills, he claimed he didn't like spending money, despite evidence to the contrary, and planned to retire from hacking after the Turpin heist. However, all of that changed following Truglia's arrest. An investigation into Turpin's missing crypto revealed Pinsky as the critical player. O'Donnell, one of Turpin's attorneys, listened to recordings of all the hackers involved in the crime, and their conversations made it clear that Pinsky had orchestrated the heist. Since he was still a minor, Turpin's legal team contacted Pinsky's mother. Although her son denied his involvement, shortly after their conversation, he sent Turpin cryptocurrency, cash, and a Patek Philippe Nautilus watch worth over $100,000. Pinsky's actions could be seen as his attempt at repayment, but no legal legal conditions were negotiated for the cash and the items. Turpin purposefully waited for Pinsky to turn 18 before taking legal action against him so that he could sue Pinsky as an adult. Turpin intended to sue him for damages with the expectation of Pinsky paying back three times the amount he stole. Four years after the crypto theft, Pinsky agreed to pay Turpin a $22 million judgment. A condition of the civil suit against Pinsky is that he testify under oath against AT&T in court as part of a separate suit Turpin filed against the 
the cell phone carrier. Kirpin filed a $225 million lawsuit against AT&T for allowing their workers to manually override the system in place to protect his information. Penske claimed to be broke and unable to pay Turpin the $22 million, but will be off the hook if AT&T pays back at least that balance, being the $22 million, as you can't collect twice for the same obligation. Penske never faced criminal charges over the heist. The court date for the suit against AT&T is planned for May 2023. Penske better be saving his pennies if AT&T doesn't have to pay up. Number 1. Millions in Cash Anastasia Kotvitska, the wife of Ukrainian politician and tycoon Igor Kotvitska, snuck millions of dollars in cash across Europe in her baggage. She split the money between US dollars and euros, which she took with her through a refugee border crossing into the EU while fleeing Ukraine. Hungarian customs found the cash in Kotvitska's luggage while traveling with her mother and two Hungarian men. Igor Kotvitsky denied removing any of his money from Ukrainian accounts, but closed his social media accounts following the backlash he received. And Anastasia claimed she was leaving her Ukraine to give birth. Her adult daughter dismissed the story as being fake. The pregnant traveler allegedly didn't declare the money when she passed through the checkpoint out of Ukraine. It wasn't until Hungarian customs officers discovered the money that she declared that she brought it into Hungary, an EU country. It wasn't the first time the couple faced backlash. Igor Kutvitsky was once Ukraine's wealthiest member of parliament and a controversial figure in the country's politics. Kutvitsky frequently uses his associates to help him control the nuclear energy systems of Ukraine and uranium deposits across the country. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, many wealthy and elite people have been sneaking their fortunes abroad. Customs officers and border agents take bribes to turn a blind eye. It's turned into a lucrative business, and border agents and customs officers make 3 to 7.5% of the total amount of cash people are transporting. John McAfee saw a group of black-suited thugs on the dock next to his property in Belize at 10.30 p.m. They dispersed on the beach. Then, less than an hour later, all of McAfee's dogs had been poisoned. The next morning, McAfee's dogs passed away in a terrible manner. His beloved dogs, Dipsy, Lucky, Guerrero, and Mello, had died, and now he had to call his girlfriend to tell her about Mello. She didn't take the news well. Her reaction was pretty straightforward. If anyone messed with her dog, they were going to get it. Gregory Fall got it. His name might be known worldwide for its association with the popular antivirus software, but John McAfee's crazy life stretches far beyond the company he founded. McAfee was born in the UK, but moved to Virginia when he was young. Life wasn't easy. John's father was an alcoholic, and when McAfee was 15, committed suicide. Understandably, the event profoundly affected John for the rest of his life. During his college days, John took up drinking, but it didn't control his life the same way it did his father's. At least, not yet. At that point in his life, John was doing pretty okay. He was already an entrepreneur, running a business that sold magazines door to door. In the late 1960s, John worked at a company that coded punch card systems where he was exposed to the basics of early computing. He later used that knowledge to get a job at Missouri Pacific Railroad where he helped the company use an IBM computer system. However, McAfee was prone to distractions, and by distractions, we mean illegal contraband. At Missouri Pacific Railroad, he transitioned from alcohol to that harder contraband. He'd go to work while too busy tasting colors to be bothered with things like his job. One day, McAfee went to work after inhaling some distractions, but decided he wasn't living la vida loca as much as he wanted to. So he did what most people would do who wanted to increase the amount of loca in their la vida and took down an entire bag of psychedelics. His co-workers asked him questions, but he couldn't understand their words and thought the computer was scheduling train journeys to the moon. Soon, he was outside the building freaking out and hiding behind a trash can hearing voices. That was the last time John was ever at Missouri Pacific. Even years later, 
The experience had affected him so deeply that he still believed he was in Wonderland with Alice. But his addiction issues didn't stop his career from taking off. He worked as a programmer for NASA, focusing on the Apollo program. Then, John went to Univac as a software engineer, and then to Xerox as an operating system architect. At work, he'd snort distractions and drink hard liquor at his desk. Sick of feeling scared and alone, he got sober in 1983. Personal computers were still new when the first computer virus hit them in 1986. McAfee studied the programs that infiltrated computers and decided to find a way to fight against them. McAfee created the first antivirus software in 1987 and his company, McAfee Associates Inc. People needed to buy his product and John knew how to get through to them. He was interviewed for different news channels where he warned of the collapse of industries and companies that couldn't recover if a virus infected their computer. At the time, this probably seemed like fear-mongering, but today, it's just good sense. A computer virus called Michelangelo appeared on the scene in 1992, and McAfee ensured that everybody knew about it. People didn't commonly buy antivirus software at the time, but after he claimed that the new virus would infect millions of computers, consumers rushed to find ways to keep their devices safe. As it turned out, McAfee's number was dramatically inflated. Michelangelo only infected tens of thousands of computers, but its legacy would be that it launched McAfee into a multi-million dollar business. By 1992, the company was incorporated, and in 1993, McAfee stepped down as chief executive to take on the role of chief technical officer. A year later, he sold his remaining shares for $100 million and distanced himself as much as possible. John no longer had any involvement with the company and resented that his name was still attached to it. When Intel merged with the company in 2014 and renamed the software Intel Security, he was ecstatic. He celebrated and publicly said he never wanted to be associated with the industry's worst antivirus software anymore. But that joy was short-lived. Intel demerged with McAfee and John's name went back on the company. The financial collapse in 2008 hit hard. John's fortune shrank dramatically, and he sold almost everything he owned, including his private airport in New Mexico and a thousand acres of land in Hawaii. McAfee's legal troubles were adding up. Someone crashed their plane during a lesson at the flight school he owned and died. In a lawsuit against him, John was named the party responsible for the accident. Another person tripped on his property in New Mexico and sued as well. With the lawsuit stressing him out, John reasoned that if he was out of the country, he would be harder to target. And if he lost either of the cases, the plaintiffs would struggle to even collect their money. John wanted to go somewhere English-speaking that wasn't too far from the U.S., but still had stunning beaches. In the 90s, he visited the tiny nation of Belize and fell in love with it. So, off he ran. At first, living in Belize just made John feel a bit uneasy, but that feeling quickly grew up to be a full-blown paranoia. In Belize, John had decided to dive into the world of antibiotics. He must have been sick of dealing with viruses, wanting to build a product using plants to combat illnesses. He elicited help from microbiologist Allison Adenizio and started the company Quorum X. Adenizio quit her job and moved to McAfee's compound. She planned to further her research into plant-based antibiotics, but his eccentric behavior became frightening. John bragged about taking over the Belizean government and told Adonisio that he could have people killed or maimed. He often spoke of hitmen. He was volatile, violent. When she spoke to him about returning to the U.S., he handed her a glass of disgusting-tasting orange juice that he had spiked. With hazy but horrifying flashes of memories from the hours following having the drink, she knew it was time to leave. After Adonisio purchased her ticket home, McAfee cut the power and left to get a gun. She texted friends who snuck her out of his compound. The next day, she fled the country. McAfee was convinced that a local man, David Middleton, had broken into his home. McAfee simply couldn't abide by that. He felt that he needed to send a message to anyone that dared cross him. In a country where half of the police's salary is paid in bribes, any sort of weakness or disrespect could be dangerous. John called his former driver, Tom Manager, and ordered him to get three guys and find Middleton. The three men called McAfee, who wanted to see Middleton face to face. So they drug him into McAfee's vehicle, drove him into town, and dumped him in a public place. When one of Middleton's friends, a guy named Mac-10, probably not his real name, learned of Middleton's assault, he came close to trying to kill McAfee himself. Instead, McAfee recruited him. McAfee had 11 dogs that roamed his property. They would bark, growl, and show aggression towards any passersby. His neighbor, Greg Fall, couldn't take it. He confronted McAfee about the dogs, even threatening to shoot them. McAfee did nothing to control his dogs, so Fall filed a formal complaint at the mayor's office about the dog. On November 9, 2012, McAfee realized someone had poisoned his dog. A few days later, Fall was dead. Someone took his iPhone and laptop from the scene, and whoever it was 
didn't seem to have to force entry. Police came to simply question McAfee as a person of interest, but when he saw them, John was sure their plan was to torment him. So he ran towards the sand, burying himself, and using a card box to cover his head, like you do. Despite being incredibly uncomfortable, he stayed there for hours. The police raided the compound and confiscated all weapons from the property. McAfee's groundskeeper told him when the police left and explained that they were investigating Fall's murder. McAfee claimed that was the first time he'd heard about it and claimed that the killer was actually looking for him, not Fall. But there's been talk that Mac-10, his bodyguard at the time, was paid $5,000 to kill Fall for poisoning McAfee's dogs. Mac-10 denied the allegations, but also went into hiding. McAfee refused to cooperate with the police, fleeing to Guatemala instead. A journalist from Vice took a photo of him after an interview and posted it online with the geotag still attached, giving his location to the authorities. McAfee later went to Guatemala City to seek political asylum and was denied. Not long after, authorities arrested him for illegally entering the country. The board, reviewing his plea for asylum, denied the request, and officers moved him to a detention center where he awaited deportation to Belize. A day later, John had two minor heart attacks and had to be hospitalized. Or, in true McAfee style, that's what he wanted those around him to believe. It turns out that he was actually just playing up his high blood pressure and anxiety. He faked the heart attacks so that his attorney had time to file a series of appeals to prevent his deportation to Belize. And with that, they chose to send him back to the U.S. instead. By January 2019, McAfee was on the run once again, this time to get away from U.S. authorities. After a grand jury convened to indict him and his wife, he moved onto a boat where he lived internationally before the IRS could even confirm the indictment's existence. Between 2014 and 2018, he earned millions of dollars but never filed his income tax returns. He admitted publicly that he stopped filing tax returns in 2010 because McAfee believed taxes were illegal. These views, however, were not shared by the IRS, who not only felt they were legal, but that John owed some money. The day after his arrest, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filed a complaint against McAfee for promoting initial coin offerings in a cryptocurrency pump and dump scheme. The scheme is intended to create a buying frenzy through misleading information to artificially inflate the price of a stock, or in this case, crypto. McAfee made himself look like an impartial investor, but made $23 million in digital assets from the scam. On Twitter, John claimed that Bitcoin would go up to $500,000 within three years. Then he said it would increase by $1 million by the end of 2020. Eventually, he tweeted to admit to everyone that he just said those things to get new users. By March 5th, 2021, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York formally indicted McAfee. He was waiting in a Spanish jail for his extradition to the United States. A few weeks later, the Spanish National Court authorized the extradition, and McAfee proved that he would stop at nothing to avoid facing his charges. Hours after the court ordered his extradition, McAfee was found in his prison cell, and the autopsy ruled his death a suicide. Rumors spread that he didn't commit suicide. John said multiple times that if anyone ever found him hanging from the ceiling, it would mean he was murdered. He was so sure of his impending doom that he had the word whacked tattooed on his arm, believing that to somehow be proof. An ex-girlfriend claimed that two weeks after after his reported death, she received a phone call from John. He told her he wanted her to run away with him and had apparently paid people to fake his death and planned on hiding out in Texas. McAfee's widow dismissed the claims as unlikely. If he was on the run from the SEC and the IRS, she said, it wouldn't make sense that he would stay in the country. However, she also doubted that he had committed suicide and called for an investigation into his cause of death. McAfee was known for always being able to control his narrative. He enjoyed playing with the public's perception and over the years, had become a master of manipulation. McAfee often toyed with the idea that what you thought you saw wasn't reality. Ultimately, no one really knows what the truth is, even his ex-wife, because in John McAfee's world, anything was possible. It's just after midnight on a September evening, and Christian Murphy, aka Murda Murphy, was watching TV at his home in California. Suddenly, his phone starts buzzing. He checks it and reads a shocking message. Someone from an account he didn't recognize had just threatened to catch him outside, meaning they wanted to get him, and not for tickle fights. Murda Murphy isn't just an average guy. He's a reasonably well-known music producer, manager, and entrepreneur who has worked with high-profile rappers such as Takashi69. Hours before Murda got the threats, 6ix9ine had posted a message to his 20 million followers on Instagram that mocked the tragic passing of rapper PNB Rock. PNB Rock's fans didn't take well to this, so 
they decided to target someone close to 6ix9ine with threats, and that person was Murda. Murda isn't just a music producer and entrepreneur. He's also something of a social media personality with a huge following on Instagram. The massive following meant he could charge a lot of money for promotions on his account. He had around 300,000 followers and could easily rely on the account for necessary income. That night, Murda kept an eye on the front door, watching for any threats. But he was being threatened by OBN, a mysterious figure who was known for getting Instagram accounts banned. The threat wasn't going to come from someone showing up at Murda's house. Before long, OBN made good on his threats and got Murda's account shut down. An investigation by the online website ProPublica unraveled the entire business model of OBN Brandon, the self-declared master of banning and unbanning Instagram accounts. The investigation found that OBN, who also goes by OBN Brandon, has prompted Meta to ban an array of influencers and entertainers. Interestingly, OBN is pretty vocal about his business too. In an article he wrote for Facts.com last year, he called himself the Logout King because he could get Meta to ban the accounts of multiple celebrities and influencers. He says he has made over $300,000 from getting Meta to ban and unban accounts. He uses several strategies to take down his victims. One of his methods to take down an account was by accusing it of impersonating another account. To do this, OBN would get hold of a verified account. This account could be a hacked one or one he has access to. Then he would change the name and profile picture of the verified account to one he wanted to get banned. Then he would report the account he's targeting as an impersonator of the verified profile. Since Meta doesn't do extensive checks on this sort of case, they would ban the account without knowing that it's a scam. Since much of Meta's customer support infrastructure is automated, having an army of bots means that OBN could easily get Meta to flag certain accounts. When accounts have a number of flags, they automatically get removed. Aside from using bots, OBN also claims to have connections to actual staff of Instagram. He says he can get some accounts banned by searching for suspicious articles about them online and forwarding those articles to his contacts. His contact would then find a way to ban the account. He also claims that he can use this same route to unban accounts since he has a personal relationship with these employees at Meta. OBN and other scammers like him don't target all accounts. Instead, they go for people who have vulnerable accounts because their content verges on nudity and adult content. This means that most of the victims of these scams are lifestyle influencers, rappers, and only fan models. OBN targeted the money-making vehicle of his victims. Murder one of OBN's victims, was making about $20,000 per month through his Instagram account. That rounds up to about $240,000 per year. It's easy to think of OBN as just a random nerd hacking into people's accounts and reporting them to Meta, but that's not the role he plays. The videos and pictures he releases online show him wearing expensive watches and even driving a white Lamborghini. He's quite knowledgeable about the entertainment scene, so he knows who the up-and-coming celebrities and entertainers are. Some of these people include include podcast hosts and C-list rappers, and those are the type of people who are especially attractive targets for him. OBN doesn't have a standardized fee structure, but according to reports, he charges as high as $5,000 to reactivate accounts he got banned. But once the fee gets paid, OBN ensnares his victim further by getting the account banned again. This kicks off a cycle of bans and reactivation that continues until the victim runs out of money. Despite Meta knowing about OBN's scam, the company has put very little public effort into stopping the grift. The police, too, have done very little to track OBN down despite getting several complaints from his victims. To show just how invincible he was, OBN decided to post an email from the Las Vegas Police Department that showed that he had met the requirements to continue applying to be a police cadet. It was like he was taunting his victims by applying to join the police force despite the illegal nature of his business. OBN was telling them that he was so untouchable that he could join the police and nothing would happen. The most shocking thing about OBN is that despite having a larger-than-life online personality, no one knows anything about him. He's as close to a ghost as you can get in today's digital world where everyone has a footprint. No one even knows if OBN is one person or a group. However, investigations by ProPublica have revealed that OBN might not be as invincible as he thought he was. They might even just have revealed his identity or at least that of someone close to him. The person in question is Edwin Reyes Martinez. New 
numerous clues connect OBN to Martinez. For one, Martinez is the owner of the bank account OBN told several of his victims to send money to. He also told them to pay him via an email address that had Martinez's name. That email address also partially matched the redacted email address that was on the police cadet email that OBN had posted to mock his victims. A similar string of letters that were the same as his email appear in a Twitter username. That account bears Martinez's name and has photos taken inside a white Lamborghini. Although the videos and pictures don't show the driver's face, the driver is wearing a gold ring that resembles that worn by Reyes Martinez on his Facebook account. Another Facebook picture from the same account shows Reyes Martinez posing in front of a white Lamborghini that's quite similar to the one that OBN claims to drive. Eventually, Reyes Martinez was tracked down to a physical location and it appeared that OBN lives with his mom. When he was interviewed by a journalist on the trail of the story, Martinez denied any knowledge of knowing OBN. However, when he was shown evidence of collecting thousands of dollars for OBN through his bank accounts, he came clean. Reyes Martinez told the reporter that someone named Brandon had asked him to funnel money through his bank account to unknown recipients. To prove that he wasn't OBN, Martinez argued that his hand showed that he was a hard worker, and that if he were OBN, he wouldn't be working at all. That would have been a convincing argument if the reporter were a 10-year-old. OBN isn't some superior whiz kid that can just trigger bans whenever he feels like it. He needs Meta to do the heavy lifting for him, either by triggering their automated systems or by contacting an employee at the company to do his dirty work. This means that he has extensive connections inside Meta itself. One good example is how he knew or instigated the banning of another Instagram user known as Joey Hickson. Hickson was one of the earliest social media influencers and built a living off creating meme and lifestyle pages with millions of followers. Hickson had done business with OBN before and had paid him to help get certain users verified and others get names they wanted. After initially cooperating and delivering for Hickson, OBN suddenly switched and started threatening to take down Hickson's accounts. He then posted a cryptic message to Hickson asking him to enjoy his cease and desist letter from Instagram. This got Hickson worried, so he decided to check his mail. And right there was an email from a law firm on behalf of Meta asking him to cease and desist from using Instagram. That day, all of Hickson's accounts were banned. Once Hickson got the letter, OBN started bragging about it on his Telegram channel. He kept saying that he was the one behind the letter and had gotten Meta to ban Hickson because Hickson had allegedly stolen $20,000 from him. OBN's messages on the channel insinuated that he could get anyone banned if he felt like it, but OBN didn't stop there. He then tried to convince Hickson that he could get the cease and desist reversed if he were paid $15,000. He said that the letter was a result of an impersonator creating damaging content in Hickson's name and then reporting the post to Meta. OBN told Hickson that since he knew the law firm Meta was using and the lawyer in charge of the case, he would simply tell her that the accounts and posts were falsely made to frame Hickson. Meta, however, had something different to say about the matter. When contacted for comments, Meta said Hickson's accounts were justifiably shut down because of multiple infractions. Another victim of OBN's hacking and banning is Miami real estate agent and model Kay Jenkins. Jenkins' Instagram account had over 100,000 followers and she used to earn about $20,000 per month funneling people from Instagram over to her OnlyFans subscriptions and also making sponsor posts on her IG account. After Jenkins moved from Utah to Miami, her account got banned several times. This happened to both her main Instagram account and the other account she used for her life coaching business. Months after her accounts got banned, Jenkins learned about what happened by chance. She went on the popular Fresh and Fit podcast where she met Selena Powell. Powell was also a celebrity and worked as an OnlyFans model. She had risen to fame by claiming to have had intimate relationships with popular celebs like Drake and Snoop Dogg. Before the podcast, Powell had given OBN a shout out on her account and said he helped her with Instagram services and anything that had to do with banning and unbanning accounts. After the podcast, she rode the elevator with Jenkins and then started making a call. On the call, Powell spoke about getting someone's account unbanned. Jenkins heard this and asked if Powell could get her account unbanned as well. Powell said yes she could because she was the one who got it banned in the first place. Her reason was that Jenkins had danced with her ex-boyfriend at a Miami club and the ban was payback. Jenkins was a bit hopeful that if Powell was the one who got the account down, she could at least get it back up. So she asked Powell for help in getting the account unbanned. Powell agreed and said that she would reach out to OBN. Not long after, the account was reactivated. A week after the podcast, Powell posted another shout out for OBN. At this point, Jenkins was still angry at Powell for getting her banned, so 
she cut the friendship off. A while later, Jenkins' account was banned again. Over the next year, Jenkins' account would get unbanned again, and Powell would be imprisoned for an unrelated case. While Powell was serving time, OBN contacted Jenkins directly and promised to get her account verified for a fee. Jenkins basically told him to kick rocks since she wanted nothing to do with him. So, OBN cursed her out and told her that she would pay for refusing his help. Two days later, her account was banned again. This time, Jenkins was really at her wit's end. So she decided to contact OBN and make peace with him. This would turn out to be an extremely expensive decision. OBN told her that he would be happy to help and shared a screenshot of a text he sent to a high-level operative in Meta who helped him with banning and unbanning accounts. Interestingly, he forgot to redact the name and profile picture of this high-level operative. OBN told her that she needed to pay him $5,000 to get her account unbanned. Jenkins saw no way out of her predicament and decided to pay the $5,000. Her account briefly came back online, but it was swiftly taken down by Meta once again. After the most recent banning, OBN quickly blocked her and deleted their conversation. Jenkins had no choice but to go straight to the OBN source at Meta. Since he had shared a screenshot of a conversation he had with him, she was able to track his account down and message him. When she messaged the Meta employee, he told her that he sympathized with her but had no clue what went wrong and why the account went down. He then struck an agreement with her to try and unban the account for $4,000. Jenkins sent the money and the account was unbanned, but it got banned again four days later. Jenkins was asked to send another $4,000, so she did, and it was unbanned again. The next day, she woke up to a message from OBN telling her that he was aware that she was talking to his contact. Then the account was banned again. That was when she realized that the whole thing was a scam and she had been paying OBN all along. He had posed as a Meta employee to get even more money from her. Jenkins decided that she had had enough and got a lawyer to sue Meta. The case is still ongoing. OBN has recently come out to announce that he was no longer in the business of banning and unbanning accounts and that he would block anyone who spoke to him about getting accounts banned. He also blocked the reporter who had spoken with Reyes Martinez about him. But OBN still wanted people to know that he was in other sorts of Instagram business such as claims and verifications. But who knows whether even that announcement is just something to get reporters off his trail. People like OBN Brandon are much more dangerous than you'd think. There are many who would roll their eyes and laugh at someone who got their Instagram account banned, seeing that it's really no big deal, and paying someone as much money as Jenkins did may sound absurd, but there's plenty of money involved. Comments about getting a real job are often thrown around, but obviously those are comments from people who don't really understand how much work is actually involved in building and maintaining maintaining a big social media account. What OBN did is no different than what the mafia did to small businesses who didn't buy their quote unquote insurance. What happens when people turn things around on the scammer? Let's get the ball rolling with number five, his own money hostage. One man in Lebanon robbed a bank to get his own money. And his story is sadly becoming commonplace. Abdallah Al Saeed, sitting on around $50,000 in deposits with his local bank, had become frustrated with the strict $200 monthly withdrawal allowance imposed since the nation's economic collapse in 2019. After watching his balance dwindle due to fees and his family get by with barely any access to their money, he had enough. Al Saeed made a pit stop at the cemetery to pray over his mother's grave. He knew he was about to take a huge risk. He made another pit stop at a local gas station. After that, Al Sayi and his father made their way to the bank. He brought a gun along with two cans of gas and a lighter. Once he made it to the bank, Al Sayi almost didn't go through with his plan. He saw some children who had entered the bank with their parents and didn't want to put them through what he was about to do. He waited for the kids to leave then made his move. Al Saeed followed the bank manager into an office. He didn't state his threat, but he didn't have to. He made a show of having the gas and lighter at the ready as he asked for what was his. You'd think the bank manager would back down at this point, but he tried to meet Al Saeed in the middle. He offered to cut an immediate check for $10,000. When the offer got turned down, the bank manager went to his superiors. Negotiations went out of control. Al Saeed snapped when he heard people trying to get his own brother to arrest him. 
The brother worked for what's essentially Lebanon's equivalent to the FBI, which means things had gotten pretty extreme at this point. Al Saeed started to scream at the top of his lungs and fling gasoline all over the office. He openly threatened to light the bank up with himself, police, bank employees, and other customers all in it. Finally, bank officials caved and gave him his own $50,000. He called his wife, handed the money over to her, and was arrested. Al Saeed was ultimately released and even got to keep the money. He spent 17 days in jail. Part of that was spent not eating. He went on a hunger strike after orders were passed down to hunt for his wife and confiscate the money. Luckily, she left their kids with their parents and made a run for it. The family isn't out of the woods yet. Al Sayi is currently free on $200,000 bail, but he'll eventually have to go back to court. All of this drama didn't come about at once. It was born of a long standoff between Al Sayi and the bank. For starters, he had originally deposited about $400,000 in his account. The the massive deposit, proceeds from the sale of a family property, were supposed to help Al Saeed with a business opportunity. In his wife's native Colombia, Al Saeed had his hands in a car wash business that was starting up. With just a few suppliers left to pay, his money got tied up and the deal fell through. Taking out bigger chunks by check to get around the direct withdrawal limit has its own limitations. As if to counter all the bank's fees, you're escaping by taking out your own money, the institution charged over 20%. This is where a lot of the original deposit amount went. Al Sayi had tried before to have the bank hand over what was his, and it never ended well. With how it went this time, the public is split on whether to call him a hero or a villain. Similar stories are happening throughout Lebanon right now. Nobody's sure what will happen once the locked up cash and other resources are depleted. Number four, the same situation. Lebanese woman Sally Hafiz lost access to her money amid the country's financial crisis. She needed cash to fund her dying sister's cancer treatment, so she robbed a bank, just like Abdallah al Sayyid. But every dollar she stole belonged to her anyway. She held up the bank with what was later reported as a toy gun and walked out with $13,000. The frustration came with the withdrawal limit. Hafiz had an urgent need for the cash and didn't have time for a prolonged standoff or a complex scheme. It was just her, a toy gun, and her own cash. Police got involved, but they ultimately released her with no charges filed. After all, she didn't put any lives in danger. The deposit limit that Hafiz faced was $800 per month, a limit placed by the federal government and not by the individual bank. Accounts funded in dollars are subjected to a seriously low exchange rate, meaning that taking out money in that form entails a significant loss. Such limits and related fees are in place to stop the public from draining the system with bank runs, like what happened at the beginning of the Great Depression in the United States. Left with no other choice, it looks like Lebanese citizens are going to have their savings one way or another, even if it means committing a crime. Number three, the student becomes the teacher. Ross Walsh from Limerick got a scam email from Solomon Gundy, but rather than falling victim, he victimized the scammer. Solomon had wanted to bring Ross under his wing, allegedly as a business partner in stock trading. As a sort of fee for imparting his knowledge of the field, Solomon wanted Ross to send him 1,000 pounds. Ross's response rocked the comic-loving scammer. He attached proof of payment via PayPal for 50,000 pounds. According to Ross, the paltry amount that Solomon had asked was insulting. Scoffing that Europeans like to go big in business, he sent over what turned out to be a doctored screenshot. He even went as far as urging Solomon to be quick about a reply so they could get their next move straightened out. When Solomon came back to him saying that he hadn't received the deposit, the stage was all set for Ross's counter scam. Ross told Solomon that this had happened before. The bank had frozen the account he used for the transaction due to suspicion of fraud. In order to get the bank to move things along, Ross said that Solomon would have to send him a little money for the bank to see two-way activity. He said that when this happened before, just 25 pounds was enough to get the ball rolling. Solomon fell for it. Ross wasn't satisfied with getting the scammer to send him some cash. He insisted that the tax man may be watching their messages and made up a coded language that made things sound even more ridiculous. He got Solomon to engage in some banter in his codex. The two discussed their business plan for a bit, then Ross threw the whole scam back in Solomon's face in truly glorious fashion. He shot back a message encoded, warning Solomon against trusting bank transactions when he didn't have the cash in hand. At this point, Ross cut off communication and left the wannabe comic villain hanging. Later on, he donated the money to the Irish Cancer Society. To rub some salt in the wound, he later put out an account of what went down, along with a screenshot
screenshot of an email confirming his donation. The donation amount was exactly what Solomon had sent him. If the scammer was smart enough to find Ross online after exchanging emails with him, he would see how it had all played out. Ross, for his part, said that he's not in this game to get money from scammers. Instead, he wants to waste their time and make the public aware of common scams. He expressed concern for more vulnerable crowds, such as older folk, who may fall victim to scams like the one he backfired. Number two, not catfished. Scammers hit Lynn Hawes, a mother of five from Chester, UK, with a particularly heinous grift that stole around 100,000 pounds. Once the jig was up, Lynn got with the police and exacted her revenge. Hawes met a man on Plenty of Fish who went by the name John Wilmots back in March of 2015. Bouncing back from the end of a 17-year relationship, Lynn was vulnerable. John turned on the charm, and she was instantly smitten. He appeared to be the whole package, smart, funny, and of course, a real person. When he turned up in person on a date and matched his picture on the dating service, much of Lynn's doubt evaporated then and there. Problems came about two months down the road. Wilmot's job, supposedly with an intelligence agency, was getting in the way of the happy couple enjoying one another's company. Wilmot's was being called away to Israel in the line of duty. A month later, John told Lynn that his father had passed away, leaving a seven million pound inheritance behind. The hang up, of course, was that the money had to be split up between John and his sister, and he would have to go to Dubai to make sure it all went according to plan. A few months later, he invited her to join him and make it a couple's holiday. When Lynn arrived in Dubai, she expected to be greeted by her boyfriend. Instead of Wilmot's, a man named Phil, she had expected to be helping to some degree with the estate business, was blindsided when Phil gave her an anti-money laundering certificate and told her to keep it safe. He told her that John was going to need it because he planned to move some serious cash across borders in the near future. Phil then set her up with a hotel room, then came back the next day with a massive stash of money. He told Lynn to take some of it, but didn't specify an amount. Lynn took the cash and paid for the hotel room. The fact that it wasn't taken care of for her may have raised an eyebrow in any other situation, but Lynn didn't think twice. The next day, the certificate that she had been asked to keep safe was gone. Without it, Lynn was told that there would be no way to retrieve the transport, the vast sum of cash that was set aside for John. It was obvious that the disappearance was the result of theft, but Lynn could never prove that or figure out for certain who took it. This left her no option but to replace it, something that Wilmonts and Phil insisted would cost 10,000 pounds. The problem? That certificate costs only $795, or $595 if you're a member of ACAMS, the organization that oversees their issuing. Since Lynn didn't have that kind of cash on hand, she borrowed it from a friend. Not long after, she got a message from Wilmot saying that the money hadn't gotten to him yet. Instead, it was being held with fees by authorities. A new player showed up to back up his claim, a supposed business associate by the name of Doug Benjamin. With all three men hounding her, Lynn fell in even deeper. Releasing that money supposedly cost another 26,000 pounds, which Lynn borrowed from her son. Lynn was still failing to see red flags at this point, but that didn't stop John from rubbing salt in the wounds. He began to call her and talk about his feelings over the whole affair. He even went as far as to mention that he was feeling suicidal over everything going on, making Lynn that much more determined to do everything in her power to set things right. Fast forward to May of 2016, Lynn was informed that the money is now released and sitting in London awaiting pickup. The catch? It's got to be converted to British pounds. Usually, this sort of transaction would take the conversion fee out of the amount being converted. In this case, the fee had to be paid up front. According to a Wilmots, he couldn't access his bank from where his job had taken him. Lynn cashed out her life insurance to foot the bill to the tune of 350,000 pounds. At this point, Lynn herself was becoming suicidal. She didn't see any possible end to the situation and thought she'd continue to bleed herself dry financially and emotionally till she had nothing left left. She was distancing herself from her family because she didn't want to tell them what was going on. In September of that year, Lynn somehow scraped together another 9,000 pounds and was about to meet up with Benjamin to throw more money down the tube. She was met at the door by police, who had been tipped off by her son that she was being victimized. She turned them away, saying all was well. Lynn continued to believe in her mysterious lover until he called her up later that same day. He wanted to check up on her. The sinister fraudster knew he was slowly killing his gold and calf and wanted to try and give her a morale boost. Instead, he got asked where he was and answered Israel. The phone number he was calling from was registered in the UK. 
Lynn didn't want to believe that she had been scammed, but she couldn't make the evidence point any other way. She made up her mind and contacted the police. She told them everything and asked their help in busting up the fraud network she was caught in. They obliged, and she set up a meeting with Doug. When Doug showed up, expecting to receive 27,000 pounds, he received a shiny pair of handcuffs instead. He didn't put up a fight in court, but he never revealed the identities of his collaborators. Ajibola Daudu, the man who had played Doug in the scheme, got 48 months in jail. The other two partners are still at large at the time of this video. Lynn stated in court that she was made to feel special, and she knows that John and his accomplices are still out there. She's certain that there are more fraudsters in on this and other similar schemes, and she wants them caught before they can do this to anybody else. Turning the tables. If you know who Ben Fordham is, you probably won't be surprised to hear that he messed with a scammer in such grand fashion that she actually started to catch feelings for him. Then he ghosted her. The prolific journalist and 2GB host has no shortage of wit, and he let it all out on Tina, a scammer who reached out on WhatsApp. It all started with her requesting a tour of the Outback and pretending to get his identity mixed up in the process. In this kind of situation, mostly anybody else would either clarify the mix-up and fall for the scam, or just block the scammer and be done with the whole affair. Fordham took the more unique approach. Fordham constructed a fake identity for the scammer. She didn't just believe him, she started to really like what she heard, at least enough to risk compromising her livelihood. Fordham's alias, Robbo, was a rugged divorcee from the land down under who had survived a kangaroo attack, among other scary Australian things. He gave Tina all the details she asked for and offered her a tour. Their conversation veered beyond the bounds of professionalism before long. Now Naturally, wife Jody Spears was in on the whole thing and having a good laugh. Fordham swept Tina up in the fantasy, and she decided to call Robbo on her personal number to cash in a promised ride around Bork. At that point, Fordham dropped contact. The scammer, probably heartbroken, did the same. Lou pays at his favorite gentleman's club in town in Houston, and he's already downed quite a few drinks. He's already spent several hours with his favorite, let's call her a personal companion for the night. But he has a huge problem on his hands. You guessed it, it's because he's still married. Normally, the average cheater would think it's a big problem that they completely smell like whomever they're doing the cheating with. But this time, the smell isn't the big issue. Lou will just go to a gas station and rub some gasoline on himself before going home. That was his go-to move to cover any suspicious scents up by spilling gas on himself for the umpteenth time. The big problem now is that he found out his lady friend is pregnant. Lou Pei is a Chinese American who made a fortune from working with the now defunct energy company Enron Energy Services. Pei came to the United States when he was just two years old and his family settled in Maryland. As a child, he was considered a math prodigy and he eventually earned a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Maryland. Pei soon started working at Enron and quickly rose through the ranks to become a high-ranking executive. In 1987, Liu Pei left the SCC to go and work for Enron. At the time, Enron was a small regional energy supplier. Pei quickly rose through the ranks at Enron and quickly became the CEO of a subsidiary called Enron Energy Services. At the time, Pei became the CEO of that subsidiary. Enron was experiencing extraordinary growth. The company's business was booming and things were going as well as they possibly could. Pei was a generally introverted and reclusive person. Very soon, he became known as the Invisible CEO because of his introverted personality. Despite being introverted, he had a penchant for living a lavish lifestyle. And that lifestyle would eventually come to symbolize not only Pei, but the executive management of Enron in its totality. In the end, Enron would face serious money problems and a fine tooth comb would be used to comb through all of Pei's excesses. Enron Energy Services, the subsidiary that Pei had 
control over was Enron's retail unit. The business of the EES, as it was called, was to sell gas and power directly to homes at a market price. The company wanted to displace the pseudo-government entities that sold power to people and wanted to offer that same energy at a reduced price directly to customers. The company spent a lot of money on advertisements as it needed to convince people to pool their energy needs directly and purchase them from Enron. However, the implementation of this strategy was a monumental disaster. Within just five years, the company blew through $500 million in expenses without generating any significant income. Despite the failure of Enron, Lupe was having the time of his life. As a CEO of the company, he earned around $100 million in salary over five years. He also received a lot of valuable Enron stock that was worth hundreds of millions. So, what did Lupe do with all the money he was making from the Enron sinking ship? Well, the gentleman spent it at gentlemen's clubs, as was appropriate for a gentleman. Despite being a reclusive man, he came alive at night. He frequented his magical clubs as often as he could and was quite fascinated by the dancers in them. He was so fascinated by these clubs that he visited them every night and often had meetings in them. After the meetings, Pei would even treat the best performing salesman to special encounters with the dancers in the club. Pei didn't just go to the clubs to watch dancers. He also made sure to spend lavishly on them. The dancers often didn't believe that Pei, a reclusive and introverted man, was such a powerful CEO. So he spent a lot of money on them to prove that he was indeed powerful and wealthy. Pei sometimes even took these dancers to his high-rise offices to show off, and the club parties would continue at Enron's offices late into the night. However, Pei had a wife, and wives typically don't like exotic dancers. So Pei didn't want his wife to find out he was spending time learning how to dance in special dance clubs. So he did what any reasonable and properly adjusted man would do. He went to gas stations and poured a little gasoline on himself before going home. He reasoned that this would get rid of the dancer's scent on him and that his wife wouldn't notice a thing. Judging by how often he frequented these clubs, we have one thought and one bit of advice. One, Hay's wife must have thought he was really bad at putting gas in his car that had horrible gas mileage. And two, pouring gas on yourself when potentially dealing with an angry woman isn't a good idea. Eventually, Hayes' adventures at these clubs blossomed into a full-on affair, or magical romance, depending on your perspective, with a dancer named Melanie Fool. As luck would have it, Melanie Fool was also married and had two kids. Things got messier for Pei when Miss Fool got pregnant, and Mrs. Pei eventually found out about her husband's extracurricular activities. This time, he couldn't hide a baby bump with a gasoline scent, Mrs. Pei wasted no time suing for divorce, and Pei found himself in a precarious situation. And things were about to get even worse for Pei, because why not? Around the same time Pei was dealing with his marital headaches, the higher-ups at Enron were discovering Enron Energy Services' massive failures and Pei's dancing expenses that were so vast, the reports ended up on the desk of Enron boss Kenneth Lay. While Pei wasn't exactly fired from the company, Enron advised him that things wouldn't go on smoothly if if he stayed on as CEO. So Pei made what must have been the hardest decision in his life. He left Enron. At the time, it must have felt like he was making a huge mistake, but time would prove that he'd made the best decision of his life. The divorce was hard on Pei. His wife had evidence that he cheated, and she was going to get every penny she could in the divorce settlement. The case was so expensive for Pei that he was forced to sell all of his Enron stock to pay his divorce settlement. Despite being in such a difficult situation, Pei was still quite lucky. At the time he was selling his Enron shares, they were around peak value. Enron's all-time stock share price value was about $90, and Pei managed to sell all of his stock for an average price of $72 a piece. At the end of the day, he made around $250 million from selling his shares. Pei paid his wife, Lana, a lump sum of tens of millions of dollars. He also had to forfeit his Houston mansion, a Houston condo, and a $3 million home in Hawaii as part of the settlement. Left with no wife, no job, and a pregnant mistress, Lou Pei felt like there was only one thing he could do. Married the dancer, carrying his baby, and moved to Colorado. By the time Pei was settling down in Colorado, a few things were happening over with his former employer. Pei had left Enron in June of 2001, but just two months later, the entire company was in trouble. The share price was tumbling down a hill, and in October, Enron had lost two-thirds of its value. At this point, the CEOs of Enron were all selling their shares while telling employees that every little thing was going to be okay. By November of that year, a single Enron share was worth just a dollar. By December of that year, the company had been exposed as a huge multinational fraud and was eventually filing for bankruptcy. If Pei had just delayed selling his stocks for a few 
few months, he would have been left smelling like gasoline and dancers holding an empty bag of Enron shares and could have possibly been facing criminal charges. When he got to Colorado, Pei bought the Taylor Ranch for $23 million. The ranch was so big that for a short while, Pei was the second largest landowner in Colorado. The ranch even had a mountain, and locals began calling it Mount Pei. Pei approached the purchase of the property very carefully. He didn't buy the land at once. Instead, he bought the entire ranch incrementally. He first purchased 23,800 acres of the southern third of the ranch for $6.9 million in cash. He also swapped real estate worth $2.6 million in Texas for it. Two years later, he completed the purchase. This means that Pei had started purchasing the land even before his wife found out about his affair and he had to leave Enron. Unfortunately for Pei, the property was a subject of intense controversy. Before Pei bought it, it had been used communally by a community of ranchers. These ranchers expected the same unreserved access they'd had to the land, but Pei was having none of it. If the ranchers had all been exotic dancers, he probably would have considered it, but they weren't. Instead of giving them access, Pei decided to beef up security. He fenced out the ranchers better than every other previous owner and employed people to patrol his perimeter. Aside from that, he diligently pursued trespassing complaints in the courts, but the issues surrounding the land couldn't be easily disposed of. The ranch had been a part of a larger portion of land ceded to the United States after the Mexico-America War. Unfortunately, the legal rights surrounding the land as a common area nearby ranch owners were never spelled out. By 1960, the land was purchased by North Carolina lumber magnate Jack Taylor. The legal rights of surrounding ranchers to use the land were in legal obscurity by the time Taylor bought it. However, Taylor knew that the locals believed that they had some claim to the ranch. Unfortunately for the villagers, Taylor didn't believe in those rights and he tried to secure the ranch as his private domain. The efforts of Taylor to restrict the locals from the land triggered a feud that went on for decades. Taylor went to court several times and the state and federal courts affirmed his right to secure his property. However, the local government wasn't too enthusiastic to enforce the court's judgments. In the end, it was the judgment of Taylor's neighbors that mattered the most. One night in 1975, a bullet ripped through Taylor's roof and shattered his ankle. That was the straw that broke the Campbell's back and he left Colorado soon after. He never returned to the ranch and ran operations there from North Carolina. The person who pulled the trigger was never caught. In the 1980s, Jack Taylor breathed his last breath and his child, Zachary Taylor, yes, just like everyone's favorite president, permitted the locals use of the land. However, Zachary only allowed limited access and this negatively impacted the agrarian industry in the county. Losing access to pastures forced many local ranchers to either pack up or drastically reduce the number of their herds. In due time, Lupe started buying up the land little by little. For a while, Pei had Zachary Taylor had a legal dispute over the extent of logging that Zachary had allowed on the ranch before selling. However, the dispute was soon settled and Pei had everything he wanted. He had all of the ranch, his pregnant mistress, and a fortune in Enron stock sales in the bank. But instead of just settling into the ranch and keeping a low profile, Pei made some important moves. Zachary had hoped that Pei would offer the villagers even more access to the land, but that wasn't to be. When a policy consultant tried to talk to Pei and come up with a plan that would make it easier for villagers to access the ranch, she was rebuffed. It appeared that Pei was quite secretive about his plans for the ranch, and those plans did not involve access for villagers. Pei was so secretive that his team told the analyst not to even mention Lu Pei when discussing plans for the ranch with them. It was clear that Pei wanted to hide his involvement with the property. Pei's first course of action was to resurvey the land and ask neighbors to prove their boundaries, all at their own expense. In a few cases, some of the neighbors lost areas of the ranch that they'd had access to for generations. Pei also also employed construction workers to build bigger fences that secured the ranch completely. Some of those fences are alleged to have cut right into the property of other people. Of course, the ranch management denied these claims and argued that they were simply maintaining old fences. Before long, the locals realized that Pei was an even worse owner than Jack Taylor. During Taylor's time, they could always find different ways to get on the property. However, Pei's fences made that practically impossible. There was no access, and that was the end of the story. There were also rumors that Pei wanted to divert water from major streams, impound them, and then sell them through a private water marketing company owned by Enron. He also planned to purchase water and land rights from his neighbors to complete his domination of the area. At the same time, the locals continually got into heated arguments with the ranch hands pay employee. These arguments ranged from accusations that hunting activities were being stifled to arguments over hiking rights. While a lot of people accused Pei of being a bad neighbor, they also admitted that he'd started the work of restoring the forest and the ranch. Interestingly, Pei also showed some willingness to help the community. It was said that he had a soft spot for young people and seniors and was willing to help the community by donating to worthwhile programs. However, that was where his generosity stopped. He was never willing to discuss community access
access to his property. Despite selling his Enron stocks and becoming quite rich, Hay was also never willing to give out raises, unless it was to exotic dancers. Anytime he gave a raise to an individual worker, he told the worker to not inform colleagues so they didn't all start clamoring for more money. All through Pei's ownership of the land, there were lawsuits and potential for lawsuits from almost every angle. The case was constantly being dragged in front of the judge, and Pei constantly had to defend his use of the land. But the fights didn't last forever. A year after leaving Enron, Pei finally got tired of all the issues that came with owning the Taylor Ranch. He sold the ranch for almost $60 million, which was more than double what he'd bought it for. These days, Pei is still married to the dancer he divorced his wife for, and they have three children. So, to all of you who are positive that that one dancer you saw last night was really into you, there's a chance. You just have to be a millionaire because apparently that helps. Pei might have sold his Colorado ranch, but he still operates ranches in Texas and Virginia. He's also very interested in Olympic dressage these days. And no, he's never had to face any serious consequences for his role in the Enron debacle. That's the sort of luck you get when you divorce your wife to marry a dancer you met at a club. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments below what's the luckiest thing that's ever happened to you.